perfect. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, some of you were here for the last session. So, you know, I'm Lucy Shackleton. I'm Head of Public Policy and Partnerships for UCL European Institute, which is the hub for European research, education and external engagement here at UCL. Um, and delighted to have partnered with the Department of Political Science on this session, um, which be small and informal, but I think really valuable nonetheless, and really, really happy to have both Rosanna uh, and Evdoxia, Evi, um, yes, Evi it's yeah. <laughs> um, with us today to talk about roles outside of the EU institutions. Um, uh, we're going to record the session today, um, so please bear that in mind. Um, and I will hand over to my student moderator. Yes, my name is Nikki Lavalli. Um, I am a master student in human rights here at UCL. Um, before studying here um, and manage sales teams back in the States. Um, and I'm excited about this um, studies so that I can switch my career up um, and hopefully learn, learn a lot today about hopefully staying in Europe and uh, potentially working with you. And uh, my name is Tamara. I'm doing the Security Studies Master's course part-time. Um, I currently work for a TV station and uh, thinking to change careers as well. So hopefully I'll be doing that in July. <laughs> And yeah, so that's us. And um, so we're going to kick with our first uh, one of this. Can you say it? Yes, Evie. Um, so Evie is currently a policy senior analyst in the Department of EU Government Affairs and Public Policy at Google in Brussels, Belgium. So hopefully that's familiar to everyone. Um, previously, she has been working at the European Commission Directorate General for Justice and Consumers in the Unit of Fundamental Rights Policy. Prior to that, she was working for more than three years at the Department of Corporate, External, and Legal Affairs at Microsoft um, as Policy Manager for European Government Affairs, also in Brussels. Um, now, in London, um, she has obtained experience in a research center exploring how technology can improve the educational system. Uh, she graduated from the University College of London with an MA Education and Technology, and she also holds uh, a BA in Social Sciences and Humanities from University of how you pronounce this that's funny. That's funny. in greece um after obtaining a professional qualification in computer science and law she is also an alumna of harvard law school executive education so all over the map there uh so thank you so much uh first of all i'm also like thankful for the invitation i can imagine that there were many people from the ucl alumni that it will be worth talking uh all the career and about their experience so i guess i did something good after ucl <laughs> and uh congrats also to melanie lucy and also to the whole team uh, simone and nikki for putting this together i have organized conference myself i can uh, only imagine how much work uh it uh, it took uh, to put all this together i think it was for one week right yes. yeah so yes um, I will not lie that I'm a bit stressed and not because I'm not used in public speaking, but mostly because, you know, you're starting, I guess, your career or you're about to, to finish your uh, postgrad or your undergrad. So just like listening to us, giving you advices, so to say, it gives a bit of uh, responsibility. But I will put the disclaimer that, um, and also you will see that once you will start your career, that by no means take my path as the only way to reach, for example, the position that I have now or anything that I did uh, in my past. Uh, I have it sitting like posted for the four <laughs> points that we need to speak. I will change a little bit of the order. So about I will start with an overview of my career that you all already you, you have obtained with my uh, bio and uh, what is an average day in life, how it looks, although um, I know that some people, they're asking in interviews, okay, so can you please explain how a day, and uh, always the person from the company says, it's super hard to describe, but it's really super hard to describe because it's, they can be different depending on the institutions. Uh, and then I will just uh, move to reflection on the skills that uh, they help me and different advices that I can give to you. So as uh, Nikki also mentioned before, I started, I was born and raised in Greece. 
I studied their social sciences and humanities. By no means, I was a person when I was 18 years old that I knew what I wanted uh, to do. Uh, and because also in Brussels, I know that every job market is very competitive, but Brussels has amazing CVs, like amazing. And you can see CVs, like for example, during summer internships at UN, at different civil society, I was, yes, I, I enjoy my bachelor's and <laughs> if I have an advice, I will also uh, uh, advise uh, that to you. Um, so I, I chose something, social science and humanities. I had also like, for example, about history, political science uh, courses, but I went for something that is a bit more generic, so to say, because I wanted also the room and the space to decide afterwards what I really want. Um, after that, I moved to London. Uh, I joined UCL. Uh, at that moment, the name it was Institute of Education, but then thankfully they got merged. And I studied education and technology. Uh, and the courses was how digital technologies I can help the educational system, and also my dissertation had a huge focus on uh, people with special needs. Uh, and my professor at that moment, she was developing uh, an application of, uh, for autistic children. So I joined this one. So you can tell that I had like digital and technology as a common point throughout my career, but that was uh, a coincidence. Um, and then uh, I stayed in London. I worked for two and a half years in a research center. We were uh, going around schools and we were just observing how technologies can improve the educational system and also specific students with special needs. And we were also following very closely the UK Ministry of Education and Culture because they wanted to introduce a lot technologies uh, in the educational system. Uh, it was a very nice experience, but I understood that I want to move to something else. So I started applying for one year. I was applying to different things. And at some point, European Commission, I, I went into the so-called blue book list at the European Commission. I don't know if you're aware. I know that afterwards we have a Q&A, but you know, we are a cozy small group. So please feel free to interrupt me. So the blue book list is 3000 people list, I think that they make it uh, through the recruitment process. And then after that, through a screening, which uh, God knows how that uh, is taking place, I guess with some algorithms and keywords, they end up in 900 people for uh, twice per year for five months, different sessions. Uh, and uh, I got into the, this list and I moved to Brussels. And because of my previous experience, I joined uh, the DG for Education, Culture, and Audiovisual, and I was working on Erasmus Plus, that it was different digital skills that people they need around Europe, etc. After that, again, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had an offer from Commission to stay for an extremely like temporary amount of time, like four months. And to be extremely candid with you, I didn't know that corporate companies, they have a department that is called government affairs and public policy. Maybe some people, in case you don't understand what is exactly this, in US, they call it lobbying. But in EU, because it's a totally different process, we just avoid this uh, terminology because it sometimes implies something dark people they believe that we're just paying politicians to promote uh, the interest of uh, our companies and especially when you're working for a tech that you know nowadays tech is everything uh, so yes we call it like more advocacy government affairs and public policy i wasn't aware that private companies they're doing that in brussels uh, I went to a conference and uh, I saw at that point, it was the vice president of government affairs and public policy at Microsoft. He was speaking and he was presenting and I said, okay, that sounds extremely interesting. And then I contacted him 
And uh, he said, yes, we have some positions. And that's how I started my recruitment process and I made it through the recruitment process. And uh, now the first advice to you arrives that throughout your career, you need to reach out to people. You never know like when you're crossing paths with different people, please you know express your ideas express uh, your dreams what are what is the career that you want to pursue you never know maybe nothing will pop up but you know maybe like someone will just like reply to you and will just give you uh an opportunity uh, how am i doing this time yeah, you're doing okay. Keep okay. going. Yes. <laughs> okay. So this is my first piece uh, of uh, advice, and especially I think working in Brussels, together with your personality, your network is your strongest asset, and not in a way that you know someone will just like you know. Of course, like you're feeling bad when you ask, "Oh, do you have any open position or anything?" But you know, at the end of the day you will offer work. So it's not something that, you know, you should feel embarrassed. And also in worst case scenario, these people, they will not reply to you. So at the end, you will not have something less than your starting point. So it's, uh, I think that, yes, please, uh, like anyone that you meet, you never know, maybe this person cannot help you, but maybe they will refer you to another person or like it will give you a good uh, piece of advice. Uh, so after three and a half years at Microsoft, at Microsoft, for your information, I was following artificial intelligence uh, policy and human rights. I wanted to experience the other side, so a governmental organization that uh, from the side of you know, the legislator who is proposing legislation and what is better than the European Commission. So I joined uh, DigiJustice, DigiJustice just stands for Directorate General for justice and consumers. Uh, and uh, I was following specifically the unit uh, that is focusing on the charter of EU. If you have heard, it's uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of EU and uh, it gives the European citizens uh, many benefits when it comes to our human rights, uh, when it comes to privacy, right of assembly, uh, et cetera. So I really wanted to join uh, the European Commission and uh, gladly I did. And then three months ago, I just, uh, I saw a position. And to be honest with you, I didn't want to leave commission and I didn't know if I want to go back to like private uh, companies, but I said, okay, I will give it a try because reading the description, it was very much like, you know, my profile. Uh, and uh, here I am, uh, I have now, I'm almost three months at Google. Uh, at Google, I'm following this information, which is especially after uh, COVID-19 and the, the war with Ukraine and Russia, it's, uh, it's a huge, top, huge topic because uh, even when it comes to Google search or YouTube, because we separate our products, uh, users are getting uh, exposed to a lot of this information. And of course, European Commission is trying, thankfully, to legislate that for platform, for digital platforms to moderate more and more the information that they're receiving and through different like processes uh, to take down um, different kind of like content material which this is sometimes extremely difficult because also when you don't have a clear legislation, then the question of who is uh, any kind of tech company, like why is it uh, in a position to take down content? Because of course, freedom of speech is coming along the way, et cetera. Uh, so this is pretty much me, my background, uh, an average life uh, in my job, it has, arranging meetings. We want a lot to speak to government officials because this is our work to promote and speak about what is the position of our company and when there is uh, a legislative process uh, to, to participate, for example, through public consultations to prepare our responses, which of course this 
uh, requires in the beginning a lot of internal because when you're working for a big organization, you have different products. So first you need to have a position internally and then you, no, okay. <laughs> uh, and then you need to reply to the EU uh, uh, institutions. Um, and uh, scheduling meetings, discussing also internally at the company about fine tuning uh, what is one position, because sometimes it's very difficult, especially when you're a big organization. Uh, and uh, sometimes analyzing texts, of course, when you take a legislation, you need to analyze it and see from all the articles, what are the ones that they influence uh, your business. Uh, monitoring a lot, you need uh, in Brussels to check a lot what is happening at the European Parliament, at Council, at the European Commission, what reports are coming from civil society or academia. Uh, and but I think that you know at the core of my work is a lot about communicating with people. So another piece of advice is that invest in your communication skills because you know like there are many kind of yes hi there are many like interesting kind of like points at doing like government affairs and public policy, advocating. Uh, proposing amendments, drafting reports. But at the core of it, I think it's a lot about communicating with people and trying to negotiate and exchange view and sometimes trying to compromise and sometimes trying to convince them that your position is what makes sense. But I think that all of this, like, you know, it boils down a lot to the impact because all these policies, regardless if you will do, for example, health policy, digital policy, agriculture, it boils down a lot to the impact that you have, you know, to the EU citizens. So it's um, an interesting part of our team. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So it's really interesting to hear. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, Rosanna. Uh, her research interests focus on analysis of digital policy and the impact on international relations. She currently works in the European Union's digital portfolio, including AI, platforms, data, digital identity, and digital... You can skip this. This is so long. I'm really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I will talk about this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about this in the university. I don't mind. I, I'll read all that. Why not? Read. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so at CEPS, she studied the impact of AI on EU fundamental, fundamental rights on behalf of the European Commission and was a rapporteur for the Industrial Policy Task Force prior to joining CEPS. See, I'm skipping Steps. now. Steps. 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 Yeah. <laughs> she conducted a study visit at the European Parliament Research Service for some client communication and foresight and earlier worked in digital journalism in Germany and Italy. Uh, her native language is German and proficient in English and very good written. So, in the matter of French and Italian, she also holds a. Do you know, I'll leave the last bit to you because I can see okay. a lot of uh, Universal Salzburg. I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce Yeah, it. if you get bored by my speech, you can <laughs> just you know, continue reading. So, uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I also want to extend like big thanks to to everyone that uh, was making this event possible. I'm really, really excited to be here. Also, because UCL um, is very dear to me. And it, I think um, really, you know, like all those big words, life changing and so on. But really my um, year at the UCL. And um, so I was an Erasmus affiliate student um, in European political and social studies ESPS and really had had a yeah um tremendous effect on on what I did afterwards um and and so yeah thanks first of all also to Melanie um and I want to speak a little bit more about my work which is very similar to what you what you shared with us but it's also very different um and uh, I think it all has to do a bit with this myth of Brussels and um, so even though we work on very similar topics. Our work is very different. Um, and I just want to, you know, give you a little bit of this impression of how it is to work in the Brussels level. And um, so to say, uh, and also maybe, yeah, br briefly explain how, how I got there. 
Um, so, but first, like a quick question, because I also heard uh, Seps, who knows Seps, um, Center for European Policy Studies, uh, think tank in Brussels? I do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> also work with you. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and another question uh, I just have, um, who knows about the AI Act? The Artificial Intelligence Act, uh, new legislation on yeah, AI. Oh, you know it. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just want to know a bit where, where to start um, so that my, my talk doesn't get too technical. Maybe um, very quickly how I got uh, to SEPS. Um, I, so I first studied a bachelor's uh, in media communication and um, political science at the Freie University in Berlin. And then I did uh, a year here at SPS because I was very interested in the impact of Brexit um, on uh, the EU. And especially also when I was here, I understood that Brexit has um, very linked to how people use digital communication and digital media and uh, how this in turn influences the political sphere. So then I went on and did a um, yeah, now this bit below starts um, in Erasmus Mundus master. Um, it's a it's a master's that you study in different European countries, and I studied in Salzburg in um, Austria, and then in Brussels for a year, and then I went to the UCLA, so U University of um, Los Angeles. Um, and this is where what was really um, let's say arriving in Brussels after being, uh, let's say, a little bit in politics and a little bit in communication and media. And when I when I arrived in Brussels, I remember it was February and everyone was talking about AI. And I was like, what is this AI all about? I, I really have no idea. Um, and I knew I'm not a technical person, so I, I cannot code. I don't have data science skills. So what normally AI is about, right? Um, but I was very interested in the implications of artificial intelligence systems on our daily lives, so algorithms and how they um, kind of, yeah, um, impact our lives when we use every kind of digital media online. So that that was what I was interested in. And so um, I chose to to study this further. Um, at the time, also, the commission was um, conducting some consultations with experts, but there was not yet um, a strong determination, which is now the case that the EU is regulating on AI and that the EU is um having this first big legislation so at the time it was very like um not a niche topic but it was not like so big as it is now and uh, and i i did a study to understand better the impact of ai and um, ethics and our european concept of ethics so what do we as europeans or we in the european union think is ethical ai but also if there's a conception of ethical AI, what is unethical AI? so what are the limits or the boundaries that say that we want to to um, yeah decide um, by a regulation. So I wrote uh, my master's thesis about this topic, and I interviewed a few experts, amongst which my future <laughs> uh, boss, so to say, uh, Andrea Renda at SEPS. Um, and and I think if uh, if I can adapt uh, your model of putting in, let's say, some pieces of advice, um, always know your next step. Um, because at the time when I was uh, studying my master's, I already knew that I wanted to work in Brussels and I was based in Brussels, so that was very helpful. But then I, I really, um, yeah, I wrote my master's thesis in a topic that I was already interested in working in further. And indeed, it worked out, so to say, um, because my um, then supervisor at SEPS, or now supervisor at SEPS, um, Andrea Renda, um, uh, has just started to work on a new study about the AI Act and about the AI regulation in Europe. So basically, then I had a very smooth transition from my master's to uh, to working for a think tank on exactly the same topic of which I was writing my thesis about. Um, and so I think this is uh, also because I knew what my next step would or should be to work further in this space, may it be in advocacy or in the European Union or in European institutions or in a think tank. And I think also, um, working in the think tank is very interesting, um, very challenging, especially when you come out of university, um, because you are overwhelmed by the amount of topics um, that you do, because normally a think tank is not, let's say, as well resourced as a private company. So uh, we mostly work with the funding from the European Union and projects on very specific projects, but that also means that you have very limited resources when it comes to personnel. So normally, um, 
work on a range of topics and you don't become an expert in something it's it's a bit almost like the opposite of university you know when you really want to specialize in one topic and then you go to a think tank you have to work on kind of so many files and and studies at least that's uh that's how it is at steps um that it becomes very difficult at one point but still i think it's super inspiring um so that, that just um on the side um what else um yes um so when i was working on then on the study in seps i i i kind of had always this interest also already um, related to brexit how would states negotiate technology policy between each other um and so actually at seps we had a new project um which is called forum for international cooperation on ai and so I had the opportunity to go to um, to Washington DC for half a year and to work on transatlantic tech policy or AI policy, so to say. And that was also a very fascinating experience because I think once you go out of outside of Brussels, you only see how much of a bubble it is. And um, so, so as I already said before, we work on similar topics, but we feel like we we have su such a different kind of work scope. You know what we do, how our day is, and so on. But at the same time, when you go outside or even to another country, you see like, wow, okay, we're really, you know, working in a very small space and the actors are extremely well positioned in their spaces. So, so that was really interesting to see it from the outside, but also to see a bit, um, let's say, those challenges and risks. Um, when you look at technology, we see that obviously technology is, is everywhere and it also it's international, it's global. But the regulations are still very country specific. So what happens when specific countries regulate technologies in a different way? And, and this is why I was basically very interested in further understanding how the EU and the US would work together, but also perhaps against each other um, in, in the space of technology policy. Um, and then uh, based on this experience, and this is where I will end with my <laughs> Tra career trajectory part um, and just focus a bit more on the day-to-day -day work steps. Um, based on this, uh, let's say, um, experience in, in DC, I um, I was working together with Andrea again on another project application that then succeeded. And we now started a new big project. It's a three-year project um, on the Trade and Technology dialogue, uh, Council or slash dialogue. Um, have, has anyone heard of you of the Trade and Technology Council? So it's a um, it's a governmental initiative between the EU and the US that indeed wants to mitigate, some, let's say, some risks and find common pathways to work together on issues uh, like data governance or AI standardization or your supply chains or um, trade challenges. And um, and we will basically support this work and. The, and why I'm, why I'm telling you about this is that um, based on my experience in the US before, um, I was basically writing this entire project application alone with my project officer as a support. And um, the fact that we won it is not only really um, wonderful and I now can work on exactly what I want to work on, but also I think in, in think tanks, you will be given quite quickly a lot of responsibility just because you know, if you push forward and if you you signal that you find something very interesting and interesting, and then you will be uh, quite quickly, I think, given a lot of responsibilities, which I think is very cool. The question is obviously if that's worth it. Um, the other side of think tank, like working in a think tank world, is what do you get out of it? You get a lot of publications. That's nice. Maybe not academic publications, but more like reports and studies. But also, as I already said, you get a lot of experience in very different fields. Um, so, uh, for example, in SEPs in my unit, um, my unit is called um, Global Governance, Regulation, Innovation and the Digital Economy, which you already see is kind of a bit of everything and nothing. So we also work on health policy, for example, that's not my topic, but my my colleagues work on health policy, we work on data governance, um, we work on pandemic preparedness, we work on better regulation, we work on global governance, um, we work on a study that um, focuses on, on clean tech, so green steel, for example, it's it's very broad. And so I guess while you get a good overview, the question is at what point kind of do you focus and focalize? So um while I really like working for Think Tank, I also think it's not for me, at least forever. Um but it is very interesting, and this would be also my second advice to you. Um show your interest, show tell people what you what you think, what you what you're curious about. 
And because that's the saying, interested is interesting. And once people remember you or know that you're very specifically in interested in one, one area, they will remember you and they will remember why you're interested in something or that you have this passion. And I think that's that's another advice um, that I would that I would give to you. Um, very quickly, I now didn't check the time. <laughs> very quickly about my day to day work. I I can just maybe tell you basically about yesterday. <laughs> very concrete case study. <laughs> um, so yesterday was a day where I had three calls. Um, one with a commission. Uh, on the new website for this new project. Um, so we had an uh, external web developer, um, three people from the commission and my my project team. Um, then I had to write this all up. So I don't have any, you know, people that help me in writing, writing reports or writing minutes. So I do that all on my own. So that took me quite a lot of time. Um, and then at the end of the day, I had another call uh, with my supervisor, Andrea, um, to, to discuss basically the next steps. And I think that's, pretty much a normal day for me at the moment so it's a lot of organization it's a lot of coordination it's a lot of communication as already mentioned um and if i'm very lucky let's say i take half a morning free and kind of get on with readings or uh, updates that i have not uh, been able to catch up with um but that's uh, at the moment for me also as i'm changing a bit more from research to managing the project uh, rather let's say an exception um unfortunately <laughs> so so yeah um and then what else did i wanted to say mm, yeah maybe we can also already like go to question and answers because we don't have so much time but maybe just like one thing that i wanted to say because you're probably also all here because you're interested in brussels right or is it more like in our work i just want to understand maybe it's it's really good <coughs> <laughs> already to transition to the questions um but if you want i can also speak a bit more how this like life in brussels you know like brussels is this kind of hub of europe like this is one reason personally for me why i really love also working in brussels is because you meet really almost everyone from europe there and also from the world right and so we can also speak about that um or i have a lot of friends i guess you too i mean you also work for the commission like how it is to work with the institutions but i heard you also had a session on that right um so so yeah i would probably just hand it over to you um yeah i mean uh, we can start off by uh any questions that we have i'm gonna check the chat uh you can start by telling us about brothels uh i think that'll be interesting for eu jobs i i see someone nodding so <laughs> and how is it working on brussels can you give us an insight and how it differs from london for me oh yeah <laughs> okay um do you do you want to start no, yes. okay i can i mean i can just think about it because i had the um, kind of advantage that i was studying in brussels so i could get used to Brussels and explore with the different institutions and the working opportunities mm -hmm. without having this pressure. But I know from a lot of people that come to Brussels because most, like not most of them, but a lot of them do indeed a Blue Book traineeship or a Schumann traineeship. So Schumann is the same program just for the European Parliament. Um, uh, and what I hear is that they kind of, at the beginning of their five months, they're already looking for jobs. And I think that's, that's kind of tough right like mm -hmm. you you already you go to brussels with the aim of really like staying in brussels and finding a job in brussels and um, while you already have a job you have to you know like look for other jobs in your kind of free time then you also want to enjoy with the city you want to network you meet a lot of people and um, who probably have like a lot of common interests most of all they love the eu normally <laughs> um and and so I think it's very tough to actually start in Brussels, mm -hmm. and also to especially get like I don't know, um, yeah. This topic of unpaid traineeships is is also a big discussion right now. So it's not well recognized, you know, if, if a company offers you no salary, mm -hmm. but then the UN is also not offering any trainees any salary. So um, uh, I think I I hope that will change soon, but the, yeah. The, the kind of once you you have something in Brussels you kind of always on this trail to, to get something else very soon or like for a lot of people at least that I speak with it's it's like that um yeah that's what I would uh, maybe like start with and then the networking is really important what you already said like can just totally 100 percent 
you know, underline that, that, you know, you, you always meet twice in life. Like we already met before, <laughs> at least virtually, um, for another project where Seps worked on and also Microsoft worked on. And probably we met, we met again when you were in DG Just, and now we meet here on this panel, you know, <laughs> like that, that's a bit Brussels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know, Evie, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I can add, but do you have any specific question in order for me also to help me? Please mm -hmm. go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I have one. Um, what are the main, like the biggest differences you did that kind of transition from the European Commission to to Google and oh, that's a good like public and private um entities and yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, well, uh, <laughs> so. Um, the interesting thing uh, about your question is that three months ago, before I joined Google, and you know, I know I have sent many mails asking uh, uh, Lucy about that, but I have been uh, also like taking some talking points from the communications team at my company that everything I'm saying here, of course, doesn't represent my current on any of uh, my previous positions, but since the session is being recorded, I will mention that. <laughs> it's, you know, it's the way that uh, you have when you're just working for a rather big uh, company. Uh, so when I joined, um, before I joined Google, I thought that, um, because the most relevant experience that I could relate to what I was about to join, it was my previous, the previous U.S. tech company I was working for. So it was, uh, my guess, it was Microsoft. Uh, and uh, then I joined, and of course, and then I can I can follow up saying about difference between public sector and private sector. But even two big U.S. tech companies that, of course, they have extremely different business models. So one is a big actor in cloud computing. And as you already know, in Office 365, that uh, they are, yes, they are working especially with public institutions a lot, while um, the other company uh, is having a platform that is hosting content, for example, which is the YouTube, has a software program that is Android, or has, for example, the whole kind of map of the web the so-called Google search. Uh, and I joined Google and I just realized that even with Microsoft, it was such a different companies. When it was coming to organization, when it was coming to when how decisions they're being made. Because for example, I mentioned before that commission once is drafting a legislation, this legislation is out for public consultation. Everyone can reply to this consultation, even if you're a huge company, even if you're an academic, even if you're a civil society. How the process is taking place inside the company is extremely uh, different. When it comes to public sector, going to your question, I mean, of course, one thing about public sector, the hierarchy is extremely, not tough in a, in, in a bad way, but it's there. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the commissioner, and everything is like, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's a pyramid and everything is like up, down, I don't know, higher down, I don't know. Up, down. Up, down. up, down, yes, thank you. So you have everything, any DG that is attached to the commissioner, cabinet, the commissioner's cabinet, um, and decides, then it goes to the director general and then it arrives to the unit. You have one very specific, of course you, people because I have been lucky enough even in the public sector in London in Brussels and I was lucky enough to work with extremely kind and nice people but in a public sector I mean maybe it was also like my experience but it's a bit like limited the amount so you have your tasks they are interesting of course if it's if, if it happens to be also on the area of your interest uh, but then it's like, you know, it's specific things and everything, you know, even like one small sentence that you will draft, it needs to get all the, all, all the, like the reviewing process, which of course also in the private sector too, but then the hierarchy is a bit 
you will never have like the president, you know, appearing and being, oh my God, you know, he's, he's it's, it's a bit like chill. Uh, and uh, of course the difference it comes that, uh, you know, I mean, when you're like a governmental institution, when you're the legislator, you're the, per of course, you know, there is also like relationships between commission and the European parliament or commission and the council, or for example, the dialogues but you have a position that you are a little bit setting up the landscape mm -hmm. private companies they need to follow that you know and even if we do have government affairs and public policy department and we do suggest amendments and everything in a law at the end of the day private companies they need to comply with anything mm -hmm. that you know comes from like uh the public so it's more than you know that you follow whatever it happened is is happening in uh, at the European institutions, and you know it's uh, I would say also yes what I mentioned it's like flat hierarchy, mm -hmm. but of course like private company with private company it's also it can change a lot. Okay, maybe just add like one sentence to this. It's very interesting because also when I um, was about to graduate, I had several opportunities. Um, so one was for the European Parliament, one was for a private company, and one was for SEPS. And I chose SEPS exactly because I'm neither bound to, you know, the one that leads or the one that follows. Well, if you want to put it like this. Um, but I, I I kind of like the space where I'm right now, where I'm kind of in between and I can observe and monitor and uh, mm -hmm. criticize or support, like not me personally, but obviously we in our work, um, we have a lot of meetings also to kind of coordinate and to see you know who does what which player does what and and um and i think as i already said like think tank works maybe not forever but i think it gives you a very good overview over the players mm -hmm. and the interactions and um, some it's, it's funny actually that you mentioned you know like private companies are more following um because we in our work see them more as the actors and the commission kind of reacting to mm -hmm. them to the business models for example that google or facebook or um, any let's say big big tech company at least in the technology policy space um is, is currently um let's say yeah proposing and then it seems to us that the commission reacts with legislation yeah. um so i guess yeah i mean there are different views on this and you also had uh, yeah. I mean, I um now I, st I studied cyber law this year and uh, I did a research on, uh, for example, on hate speech cases and uh, on the fact that uh, it's a multi jurisdictionality like the, the space is kind of, uh, there's over, I mean, territorial rules, but still it's on platforms which are, have no boundaries. So um, um, it's really like your work also really resonate with, uh, with what I studied. And so it, it would be very interesting yeah, to kind of discover that but yeah, thank you for the discussion today and of course you know everything it's a kind like i totally agree that it's an action and reaction for example of course it's not that you know the european institutions they wake up one day and they say oh let's regulate that yeah. they see that something is problematic so for example when you see that uh and also because like sometimes like platforms like working on this information it's because they don't know what they will come across we didn't know that COVID-19, you know, it will just, by way, again, I don't mean about Google, people. Um, that, um, for example, like COVID-19, a pandemic will pop up. And then at some point you had people saying, oh, don't do vaccines because vitamin C helps you. So you say, you know, I mean, there wasn't like this kind of content. Or for example, you didn't have before the invasion of Russia, um uh, of of ukraine having people for example denying the war so you know you always you you, you come across with uh, specific content the digital platforms they have to review internal policies because it's one the law and also like what companies are doing as self regulation and then you have commission say oh this doesn't look okay for also people for eu citizens of course because we are talking about uh European institutions uh, and so we need to legislate but also when the legislative process it, I don't want you you know to think that you know commission is taking everything that we say mm -hmm. in a very suspicious way of course they are aware that all the companies they serve uh, private interests 
and uh, like needless to say, they're profitable companies. <laughs> uh, but also like sometimes it's a very constructive and that's what I enjoy. Like that sometimes, because also myself, like sometimes I don't know things. We are discussing with our engineers that they give us an understanding and they're telling us, for example, what stands, the, like what this law says, this is it's, it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, and then you know when you explain with argumentation to the European institutions like sometimes they do understand that and you know they adjust the what is there so you know it's a both kind of uh, uh, like sided and way kind of like, uh, process and just to make it just a little bit more confusing and then I just also want to hear from the rest of the room um, it's funny because now, okay, it's still about digital policy, but that's kind of our area. So, <laughs> and uh, now we've come to a point where so much has happened online, mm -hmm. and so and then also the war, and then also COVID, and then already before all, everything that has kind of been changing, right? Um, and now we've come to a point where the commission has realized, wow, now we've put up so many digital legislation. We actually have no idea how they will interact in practice mm -hmm. because you know like um there's one uh, mep assistant to one uh, very important um a member of the european parliament um uh, axel foss he's a, a member of the conservative conservative party and he's a um his assistant has put out like a big big table with all the digital policy initiatives mm -hmm. and it's literally three pages long because there's so many, so much legislation that already applies, and then so much new legislation mm -hmm. that has come up, that um, even for the Commission now, it is becoming increasingly a challenge to understand how the different regulations interact. Um, and I think this is also funny because, you know, so much is being done to kind of try to improve the online sphere in such a short time, but that doesn't necessarily always make it better. So. Um, you know, when you speak about the interaction between the commission and companies, you also have to look at um, what is implementable in the end, what is realistic, and not just this kind of push to regulate. Um, I think that's that's what often, you know, when especially privacy advocates say, oh, we need to regulate, we need more yeah. tough laws and so on. Mm, yes, but also, you know, you have to see how it works in practice. So that's actually why we uh, now at SEPS do a new study and we really now try to map with the AI law or the AI Act, um, uh, how the AI Act interacts with other pieces of digital legislation, which is really difficult, <laughs> I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, um, but this is exactly, this is also one of the, let's say, sides that one has to consider that, you know, not just regulate. Yes, there's a balance. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lovely. So we have about five minutes left. There's one question. <laughs> That we can really answer here. They also have something online, maybe? There are none in the chat, but I do have some myself. Okay. The other thing is for the application to the European Parliament, I think it's still very. Oh, um, that's a good question. For do you mean internship yeah. or then for the blue book? Yeah. Uh, you want to go first? I can, uh, I can just like, uh, you know, speak up my mind, maybe like. Uh, I applied for the Blue Book traineeship three times, three, almost with the same CV. Just like every time, add five more months of experience because it was like just the next session. The first two, I didn't even make it to the one, the 3000 list. And the, the third time I did it. And once you will make it to this list, you should start like, sending emails to the head of units hey i got in that list because the fact that you got in the 3000 list doesn't mean that you will be one of the 900 i don't have <laughs> concrete advices i will say that um, and maybe you know i can also like uh, share my linkedin or anything in order like to have a bit more uh, and even i'm more than happy also uh, to give you tips. <laughs> I don't know with whom the recording will be shared. I'm choosing my words very like carefully. Um, you should use, uh, for example, like full, because of course they're using algorithms in the beginning. So you need to choose international, multicultural, you know, all these, uh, they help a lot. 
uh, in order because of course they're looking for people that they haven't lived, for example, only in one country, that uh, they have collaborated with, uh, with other people from different backgrounds. So there are like some keywords that, uh, you know, it always helps you just like to go a bit like higher in the in algorithms. Yeah. I think also it's kind of the package of um, having international experience, speaking different languages, having maybe also studied abroad, you know, like this kind of what like the UCL is kind of taken for granted, like for a lot of people, actually, this is not normal. And then, as you already said, you know, the, the keywords that, you know, you're interdisciplinary, maybe you're problem, problem solving skills and, you know, all this kind of speech. Um, and, uh, and yeah, what I really think, like, um, I have friends that uh, uh, first done a blue book and then they were accepted for the junior professional program, which is, you know it. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> it seems like you have your strategy already. <laughs> mapped out um so it's a, a two-year program where you're basically rotating between different um director generals in the commission and then come back and then get kind of a fast lane into the civil service kind of the unlimited contract in the commission and they both have very interdisciplinary backgrounds so the one one friend studied physics philosophy and something else like really weird combinations the other friend is, is kind of an energy policy specialist which also is kind of rather rare you know and so i think really the mix of things that you normally wouldn't take together is also always uh, kind of a, a good uh, actually a good yeah factor implication i would say Lovely. All right. Well, we have to wrap up here. I know there's a session starting in a couple of minutes, but we want to thank you so much for coming in person as well. Um, thank you to Trek over from Brussels. We really do appreciate your time. Um, and I hope that everyone got lots out of uh, the session so far today and definitely stick around for the one to follow. Any final words? Just a huge, enormous mm -hmm. thank you. A huge, enormous thank you to Lucy as well, who mm -hmm. and the European Institute to being a supporter of Careers Week mm -hmm. and uh, to helping uh, bring you. Thank you for your insights. Um, we're not always greatly, only greatly appreciative, but we're also extremely proud. Mm -hmm. So it's always great to welcome our alumni back.